Hey everybody, welcome back to Sounds Like a Drum, Kane's independent media production. Today, continuing our drums through the decades with my decade, the 90s. Me growing up learning to play drums in the 90s, I was born in 1981, very, very, very early millennial. It was a beautiful time to get excited about drums because coming out of some of the things that were popular right before that, I started to hear natural sounding drums again. I started to hear big drum sounds, overtones, a lot of just movement in the kit and not so much compartmentalization of each of the pieces. This was super inspirational for people my age around me as well because it made it sound a little more on records like the drums sounded in front of us and took us toward getting excited about sculpting our sound so that we could sound like our favorite players. Now, rather than trying to quantify an entire very complicated, very um, multifaceted musical decade into one tiny video, what we wanna focus on today is this idea of natural drum sounds returning, particularly with the snare drum, but also the toms, and also a couple of very specific snare sounds that were super prevalent starting right at the beginning of the 90s and actually continuing on into the 2000s. First, we're gonna start off with what we consider to be a fairly definitive rock sound from the 90s era, common in grunge music, common in a lot of the LA rock bands of the day as well. Here we go. Now let's start with the snare drum. What we're using today is my Keplinger Black Iron snare drum. It's six inches deep, 14 inch diameter, has eight lugs, and was made for me by Greg Keplinger to spec because it is what was used for a lot of the recording and live playing of Matt Cameron with Soundgarden back in the day. This drum has a very wide open sound. It has a lot of overtones. It's very, very loud. But because it's an eight lug drum, it is a little more open, a little more kind of wild. And the note in the center is a little bit beefier than it would be if it were a 10 lug instrument. As with many of our episodes, and especially with this one, there's going to be extended play over on our Patreon. If you'd like to hear more of these sounds, some of them mixed and affected, some of them put into sort of genre specific styles, that's the place to check it out. And it is also the best way to support us and make sure that we can continue to bring this content. The kick is the one thing that if I listen to this era, fairly similar across a lot of genres, short, punchy, powerful, and if it's getting a bigger kind of boomy sound, it's less about the drum being tuned differently and more about the miking and the production brought in from the room to give it that additional girth. Lastly, just to touch base on the toms, there are 
a wide variety of tom sounds in this era, to be sure, ranging from high and punchy to low and punchy, but generally speaking, we are hearing some decay, we're hearing really good attack, we're hearing a lot of warmth, and there's also clarity between them, so if you play quick fills, you can hear that, and if you play slow grooves, there's enough oomph behind each hit to fill out the space. In order to get the sounds we were after today, starting with the snare drum, using my standard favorite, which is a G12 coated batter, a 300 snare side, and then on the kick drum, we have a clear EQ3 batter and a ported EQ3 res out. Probably the most defining factor of the bass drum sound today is that there is a substantial pillow inside that is up on both of the heads to just really crush that sound down and give us all the punch we need. For the toms, we wanted to do clear on top and bottom, so we have clear G1s for rezos, and we have clear EC2 batters. These are two-ply batters, which are very common in this kind of playing, but since they're clear, we're getting a lot more attack and a lot more articulation, no matter what range we tune them in. Also, just to touch on it, a little note about cymbals. When I go back and look at commonalities between cymbals in the 90s, generally speaking, People in rock were looking for articulation, clarity, being present in the mix, not taking up too much space, and above all, getting out of the way right after you play them. So this brings us to A Customs and K Customs. Big voices in the 90s. We have Ks on one side and As on the other. And these blend in nicely with these big drum sounds because they're very articulate, they're on the brighter side, and nothing's taking up too much space. Now earlier on we were talking about this presence of overtones, this presence of sustain, and how things are a little bit more open and louder and more natural sounding. Something that I struggled with when I was first learning to play, and I think a lot of people do, is that my accuracy with my strike zone on the snare drum was not as good as it could be, and I was also used to listening to music where the drums had been muffled or affected or otherwise modified from the acoustic sound. So when I hit a wide open snare drum that's tuned well, it was still making a lot of stuff that I wasn't expecting to hear, and I couldn't hit it in the center with great consistency when I was young, so every hit sounded different, and naturally, like often people do when they're kids, we see that and we go, ah, oh, there's something wrong with the drum, there's something wrong with this sound. Surely it can't be me and my technique or my aesthetics. Okay, now we're gonna swing to the other extreme, another sound that we love here, which is the high, cracking, but still wide open piccolo sound. Now just to be clear, the only thing that we're swapping out for this portion of the video is the snare drum. These sounds all work with this snare sound as well, but this leads us into other parts of the music from this decade, other ways of playing, and different kinds of inspiration. It's become a lot less popular to use this kind of sound in pop music and rock music of late, but you do still hear it a lot in hip hop, R&B, and also, sometimes when you see people play live who need a brighter sound to get through the mix than they would otherwise use in the studio. The drum we're using today has also been featured in Spotlight videos in the past and for situations where we need this type of sound. It's a Blackwood 4x14 stave shell cherry wood snare drum that was made for me by them as well. Again, for a very specific kind of sound. With these drums, 
the tuning range is such that I can go very high, I can go very low, but because they are eight lug drums, there's a different kind of behavior with them that overall gives me a bigger and less pointed sound, which is particularly nice with something like a piccolo drum. We have videos in the past that discuss the effects of lug count on tuning and tuning range. We definitely recommend that you go back and check those out, whether you own an eight lug drum or a 10 lug drum, it'll give you some things to think about there. Now this kind of tuning was in pop music a lot, it was in rock music a lot, you can find it in metal. Um, I really relate to this sound when I listen to the Deftones or a lot of the new metal stuff. I mean, Korn was definitely piccolo a lot, sometimes with clear batter heads. But this drum in particular still gives us warmth and girth in this range and it's an ultimately nice feeling way to play the drum as well because it is tuned quite high, but we are making one very specific adjustment, which is that we are not over cranking the snare side head. The tension the snare side is under right now would work for a medium tuning or a super high tuning on this drum. It's much more for this kind of sound about the batter being very high and not so much about cranking the snare side. Incidentally, this drum is also outfitted with the exact same head setup. So you can start to see that the this being a wood drum and this being a shallower drum, but still triple flange hoops, still eight lugs, pretty much, you know, the rest of the everything is the same. Getting into the behavior that this drum wants to do by experimenting with tuning and following your ear, it's, I mean, it's surprising to me if I were to blindfold test this, that these are the same heads and the same hoops and everything, and that the only difference is that the drum is shallower and it's made of wood. The first song that had this kind of snare sound in it that really grabbed my attention was the Spin Doctor's Pocket Full of Kryptonite record, and then also early Dave Matthews Band stuff for sure. We're talking about you know early to mid 90s. And I got really excited about it too because it felt really powerful. And sometimes for me, using like deeper drums and deeper sounds felt a little bit back in the mix and it gave me a lot of satisfaction to have this like gunshot kind of sound out of the snare. I fast discovered when I started playing with other people that it wasn't always appropriate to have that kind of sound. So no matter if you're going after the big bang and rock sound or something bright like that, never forget that the context is everything. And just because we love a certain snare sound doesn't mean that we can just trot it out and decide that, you know, that's what's going to happen. <laughs> When we started doing research for this episode, we also noticed that the higher tuned snares tended to go along with higher tuned or smaller toms. This was an era when there were a lot of multi-tom kits, a lot of two up and two down, maybe even three up and two down. I saw photos of people using 8, 10, 14, 16, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, a lot of toms. But suffice to say that if you like an overall higher kind of pitch range for your toms, or if you prefer things to be really down and dirty, there was a lot of all of that in this era. Soundgarden, big drums tuned low. Some Pearl Jam records back in the day, smaller drums tuned super high. There's no right or wrong here. And that's what's the most fun to me about the 90s is that there's really something for everybody just in pop and rock music alone, never mind everything else that was going on. If you'd like to hear some of the tracks that we use for sound inspiration today, look in the description below this video. There's a list of exactly what we were listening to when we started trying to tailor the kit to make these kinds of sounds.
Now, having said all that, it is important to reiterate that this is only one portion of what was going on in the 90s, one or two portions of what was going on then. There was a ton of much more kind of straight ahead pop music, plenty of jazz, plenty of heavy metal, plenty of new kinds of heavy metal crossover stuff. We didn't talk about Rage Against the Machine, which is one of my favorite bands in the world. There was a lot happening right then. However, some of the sounds that we're using today crossed over all of that stuff, and they are representative of the aesthetic that was going on then that was just getting away from that super studio sound into a sound that had the kind of power and energy that you got from a live show. That about takes care of it. Thanks so much for checking out these sounds. I've been looking forward to this for a long time, and we had a lot of fun today doing up the kit this way. It's so much nostalgia. If you'd like to support us, please head over to the Patreon. It is the best way to support us. There's going to be extra footage from today. There's going to be Symbol Series episodes coming for the foreseeable future. All sorts of background stuff, anecdotes, and above all, support for us from you to make sure that we can continue to do this. Right now we are leaning on the Patreon more than ever. Check it out, see if there's a tier that's right for you. If you feel like upgrading to get more out of it, lots of options there as well. And as always, please like, comment, subscribe, and pay attention. We got new stuff coming out all the time. And there is a lot of music from the 90s. What's your favorite track from the 90s? It doesn't even have to be about the drums. If you have a favorite drum performance, definitely, but I am, constantly surprised by how much music happened in the 90s that I think was either from the 80s or the 2000s or that I've just straight up never heard before. We would love to hear what you're loving.